so J- Jake and Ryan roped me into this question and answer kind of deal. I hate their guts. Um, but basically, I guess they're getting a bunch of questions that they think I can answer or has been asked that I answer. Um, so these will be just quick, kind of 10 to 15 minute, uh, quick answer, rapid fire. The first one is how bullets kill slash how animals die. So for this, it's just easiest to start at the target. How animals die, how anything dies is you deprive them of whatever they need for life. So oxygen, blood, or sever the spinal cord, upper spinal cord slash brain to where it cuts the signals to the vital organs. Um, you know, the standard way is we shoot animals in the front half in the chest, so lung shots, and we're causing a pneumothorax of some sort of sucking chest wound. The lung, you know, we put a hole through, air gets in the chest cavity, the air causes pressure on the lungs, they start collapsing, the animal passes out. There's also some blood that can get in there, etc. The second way is we hit the heart and or the major vascular arteries, blood organs, etc. in the front half, they bleed out, they lose blood pressure, and they pass out. So, accepting severing the central nervous system, the spine, the upper spinal cord, or the brain, you're primarily looking at killing an animal, killing in quotes, is depriving them of oxygen or depriving them of blood, blood and blood pressure. So, then you can have a combination of the two, of course. The thing is, is lethal doesn't always mean incapacitating or rapidly incapacitating. Something can kill, but it might take days, weeks, hours. Who knows? Um, and something can be incapacitating, but isn't lethal, a.k.a. shooting high, going just over the spine, stunning the spinal cord, a- animal drops. It's incapacitating. But a couple of minutes later, they recover, get up, and run off. It's not lethal at all. So we want lethal and generally relatively incapacitating. So that's leading you to the lungs and the heart and the major organs. Okay, so the more damage, tissue damage that occurs in general, the faster, the more rapid blood loss or the faster something suffocates, loses oxygen. So if I take a pencil and I stick it through the lungs, it will take longer for that animal to to suffocate or die or pass out from that wound than if I take a football and shove it through an animal's chest. Now, obviously there's some middle ground in there, but in general, the more tissue damage the faster things die. That's not always the case, and there's certainly kind of a plateau that's hit. That plateau is somewhere around baseball size wound channel to the bottom of a Coke can size wound channel. So below that, say, inch, inch and a half wound channel, there's a difference between that and something that's creating a five, six inch wide wound channel in uh, rapidity of death or rapidity of of incapacitation, how long an animal stays on its feet slash how long it moves or how far it moves after the impact. Uh, But once you kind of reach that two and a half inch or so wound channel size, there doesn't seem to be as big of a difference. Like the difference between say a Coke can and say a football in the chest is not that big of a difference. I mean, certainly it is some, but not nearly as much as you would think. So when we, we, the first part is we have to deprive deprive an animal of oxygen or blood pressure in general to cause incapacitation, rapid incapacitation and death. Um, and then the wider we can make the wound through the lungs or through the heart, the faster that will happen or the more reliably that will happen. So that kind of goes into how bullets kill. Um, bullets kill through damaging tissue. Uh, so a couple of terms is, you know, the path of a wound channel is total penetration depth, permanent crush cavity, neck length, temporary stretch cavity, maximum temporary stretch cavity, 
and max temporary stretch cavity length. That's kind of describing a 3D, a 3D model of what the wound channel looks like. So, uh, if we imagine, like, so you have your your total penetration depth is just how far the bullet penetrated, how deep it went in inches. Your neck length is how far the bullet from t- touching the tissue until it started upsetting. So that could be expanding, fragmenting, or tumbling, yawing. So it's expressed in inches. So it could be half inch, it could be five inches of neck length. And then your temporary stretch cavity is how, if you think max temporary stretch cavity is how wide that temporary stretch cavity wound channel is. And then the max TC length is how long that temporary stretch cavity uh, is. So your permanent... If we, if we back up your, if you think about a rock being thrown into water, um, so from the surface of the rock, of the water to the bottom of the pond or creek, the penetration depth is, is how deep that is. Your permanent crush cavity in general with a bullet is the water that was physically touched by the rock as it traveled down. So if it's a two inch diameter rock, it's a two inch permanent crush cavity. Now, when we get the bullets, there's a little bit of, of of modification to that statement. But in general, that's what it is. Your temporary stretch cavity, max TC and all that is the ripples. When you throw the rock into the water, the ripples and the splash that is caused by the velocity of that rock hitting, right? And just like water comes back in those ripples and the ripples go away, most tissue in in the body is elastic, so it will stretch outward from the passage of the bullet and come back. Now, you know, if we look at, okay, we have max penetration depth and we have permanent crush cavity, what the bullet physically touches. With high velocity projectiles, so say over about 2,000, 2,100 feet per second, your permanent crush cavity, your temporary stretch cavity start kind of joining together. So, in other words, your your temporary stretch can become part a part of the permanent crush cavity. If the velocity is sufficient, the 2,000, you know, 2,100 feet per second, that tissue is getting stretched so fast that it exceeds its elasticity and it will start tearing. That doesn't mean it all tears. It just means that it can tear, right? So imagine a stretch rubber band and then you pull it too far, too fast, and it tears, it pops. Also... Um, at any velocity, when that tissue stretches, if you get fragmentation, so bullet jacket, bone pieces, etc., and they touch that stretched tissue, it will pop like a stretched rubber band that you touch a scalpel to. It will pop and tear, and now at least part of that temporary stretch cavity is a part of the permanent crush cavity. Um, so, as we as you think about it, a bullet that loses some weight that lose loses some material in fragmentation creates a larger permanent wound than a bullet that doesn't now in general high level view you give up you, you, between penetration and width of the wound so the, that maximum width of the crush cavity and the temporary stretch cavity they're a trade-off between the two so if I want more penetration, I have to give up wound width. If I want more wound width, I have to give up some penetration. How much is dependent on the bullet? But it's not such a, a huge trade-off as the, as the I guess, FUD lore, old wives' tale, or the conventional belief is. In that, the nice thing about herbivore animals that most people hunt from, you know, antelope, whitetail, to moose is they get larger, they get longer, they get taller. They don't generally get that much wider or deeper through the chest. So from rib cage to rib cage or, or quote unquote shoulder to shoulder on a white tailed deer, a real small one might be 10 inches. The shoulder to shoulder width of an elk, like a Rocky Mountain bull elk, cows are very similar. It might only be 14 inches. And you go, oh, that's 40% more. Yeah, but to a bullet, that's not that much. And from an elk to a moose might only be a couple more inches. I mean, we we used to carry, and still do at times, tape measures or rods marked out so we can measure how deep 
you know, different muscle tissues are from the top of the skin and how wide the chest cavity is. It's not nearly that much. You know, a white-tailed deer might be 70 pounds in the southeast. A full-grown white-tailed deer might be 70 or 80 pounds. And a moose might be 1,200, 13, 14, 1,500, whatever. And you go, oh, my God, they're massive. It's 10 times bigger, you know, 13 times bigger, 14 times bigger. But it's not 14 times deeper through the chest. It's only a couple of inches. So they look really big, but until you start measuring them, it can be it can be way less than you think it is, the difference between them. So on a, a southern white-tailed deer, you know, 10 inches of penetration is plenty from any point in the front half. So when I say that, we're not going to talk right now. We're going to ignore the, I'm going to shoot them in the butt through the hips, try to get through the stomach and make it to the lungs, the rear end shots that people love to talk about, but no one takes. Okay. Everybody, they say that. So they use X, Y gun and X bullet and et cetera, but they don't ever take those shots. They wait for them to turn to where they can see their front half, their chest and put a bullet in that. So say the bullet, what it touches is skin, rib, or or liver, then lung. We're not trying to put it through the stomach or from the other side facing you or more facing you. Quartering two, it's going through skin, muscle, scapula, the shoulder blade into the lungs, right? So we're we're bisecting the front half. Um, it doesn't take that much. In a white tail, 10-ish inches, a small southern white tail, 10-ish inches. In an elk, 15, 14, 13, somewhere in there. Um, is plenty. You're making it through both lungs and impacting the offside hide. Uh, a note on hide, entrance hide, is it that big of a deal? Exit hide is. So if you think about hide when you when you when you touch your skin, it's kind of firm because you're you're pressing against the muscle and the tissues underneath it. But if you pull your skin, it's very elastic and pulls away. So when a bullet goes through an animal, the reason that you're catching, you see so many bullets caught under the skin on the offside is because skin is extremely elastic. It's like a little trampoline that is catching that bullet. That bullet is lost a lot of weight and, or it's created a massive frontal diameter. So a very large frontal diameter relative to bullet. And it's lost a lot of velocity going through the animal. Um, depending on the animal in the hide, exit hide can be four to six inches worth of muscle tissue or more. In other words, that bullet trying to get through the hide to fully exit, you could have got four, six, seven, maybe eight more inches of penetration, maybe more through muscle tissue. Okay. So you just kind of have to keep that relative. Catching a bullet on the offside hide is completely fine. Um, but since the animals don't get that much deeper through the chest, the width, it doesn't require that much penetration. So you know, you have, say, like a really high weight retention lead bullet with a smaller frontal diameter, um, trophy mounted bear claws, tip bear claws, federal terminal ascents in the medium velocity range, so say below 26-ish, 100 feet per second, all the copper monos that stay together, so the barns, the hornadies, the e-tips, etc. High weight retention, um, relatively small frontal diameters. You're, yes, you can get 25, 26, 27 inches of penetration, but if you're putting it in the front half, what you trade for that is a massive decrease in wound channel size. Those bullets at, at you know, 25-ish, 100 feet per second and below, you know, a lot of times you're actually looking at the total permanent crush cavity is the size of your thumb, the diameter of your thumb or smaller. Do they kill? Absolutely. Um do they kill as fast? No, generally they do not. And when you shoot a large number of animals and you track how long they stand on their feet and how far they travel, there's a very large difference between those and bullets that come apart. When you look at a rapidly fragmenting bullet, say a burger or the tip to match bullets, ELDXs are kind of in the middle, but etc., you still get completely sufficient penetration. I mean, most of these bullets you're getting anywhere between 14 to 18, 20 inches of penetration with these bullets that fragment, except the wound channel is exceedingly large in comparison to high weight retention bullets. So when you look at a burger or a ELDX, ELDM, 
your wound channel can easily be, you know, it starts at that Coke can size and goes up. So two to three inches wide and goes up to six, seven, eight inches wide in some cases. The difference in speed of death is dramatic. Um, if you only shoot a couple animals a year and you don't really track it, you don't really pay attention, you may not see it. If you shoot a hundred animals in a week with deep penetrating narrow wounding bullets and you track all of that and you shoot a hundred animals the next week with ELDMs, TMKs, burgers, and you track the time to death and how far they went, there's a clear difference. In general, incapacitation time is over twice as long and distance traveled after the impact is double or over twice as far. Um, not always. Lots of lots of animals drop real quick with with copper bullets. But in general, when you look at you know statistical group size, when you start adding you know a data set that actually means something, you start seeing those trends. So we kind of come back to the animal. The deeper the bullet penetrates, the narrower that wound is in general. The wider it is, the wider the wound is, the less the bullet penetrates. That's not a hundred percent because the bullets that have really high weight retention but create really wide frontal diameters. So like your your trophy bonded, tipped bonded, or trophy tipped bonded bear claws, whatever. Um, federal fusions even, spear gold dots, terminal ascents at higher velocity where they maintain weight but they open up into a wide frontal diameter, that can start to inhibit some penetration because that frontal diameter is so wide and the velocity inside the animal is slowing, it's, it's having like a parachute effect inside the animal. In that case, a bullet that fragments the front half, like an ELDM, ELDX, some burgers, especially burger target, hybrid targets and OTMs, where the front half fragments or front third or two thirds fragments, and what's left is a narrow frontal diameter, maybe only caliber size, rear part of the bullet. Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of weight, but it's also got a small frontal diameter. So it's not uncommon to get as much or more penetration from these bullets that lose weight as the bullets that hold on to weight, unless they're holding on to weight by having a small frontal diameter. So kind of the, the short thing is we got to damage the lungs and or the heart sufficiently to cause rapid incapacitation and death. The larger the wound we make through them, the better. As long as sufficient penetration is, is is reached, that sufficient penetration, even on moose and elk, if you're putting it in the front half, is that 12 on the 12 inch on the minimum, more like 14, 16 inches, is going to get through scapula, bone, muscle, whatever, ribs, through both lungs, and will be caught on the offside hide. If you want an exit, there's no way to guarantee an exit, but if you want one, to go from a 40 to 50% chance of exit on that offside hide to say 75% chance of exit, you're basically going from, from a bullet that creates really wide wounds and kills really quickly to a bullet that's almost creating broad head or smaller size, fixed broad head or smaller sized wounds, and they still will not exit all the time it, when you see large, anim large enough a large data set of animals killed, large numbers of animals killed. So 14 to 16 inches of penetration, really wide wound, um, a short neck if possible, or you can use a burger that bullet penetrates four to six inches before it starts upsetting and fragmenting. Um, yeah, the widest wound channel possible.